Well, hello, xenographers everywhere, and welcome to another episode. If you want a lens that's good in low light, and that can give you plenty of background blur when you need it, an f1.4 50mm is the ideal tool for the job. There are lots of vintage f1.4s out there, and they'll all give you plenty of blur, but which should you spend your hard-earned cash on? I've put together three of my favourite 1.4s from Minolta, Nikon and Canon to help you decide. And here's the first of those lenses, the Minolta Rockor PF 58mm f1.4. In a recent episode, I tried to repair one of these lenses and although that repair wasn't completely successful, the few shots I managed to get made it clear that this lens is something quite special. So I bought another, in rather better condition. The aperture ring on this one turns nicely and cleanly. Apertures run from f1.4 to f16 in full click stops and the aperture itself has 8 blades. The focus ring turns freely and the minimum focus distance is 60 centimeters. Not quite as close as I'd like it to go, but close enough. The focus throw is about three quarters of a turn and it's a beautifully constructed lens too, being all metal with no plastic components. Wide open, this is a pretty sharp lens, which when you consider that this is an older lens design, dating to around 1961 is very surprising and that's a testament to the quality of Minolta design. Sharpness of this kind wouldn't be out of place on a 1980s lens. On a 1960s lens it's quite remarkable. In its day this lens must surely have been the one to have and the amount of detail it resolves is really quite something. Stopping down of course means that things only get sharper. At f8 detail is very crisp and very clear and in real world use as opposed to detailed analysis of test charts at f8 this is a sharper vintage lens as you'll find anywhere and it's quite a bit sharper than some. Perhaps this lens's greatest strength though is how it renders colour colours from this lens are quite simply stunning. I've often praised the colours from Olympus Zuiko lenses and they've often been the brand of choice when I've wanted strong colours but this one's easily their equal and between you and me it might even be a bit nicer. Colours from this lens are painted large with high saturation and outstanding body and depth. They're solid and substantial, bright and joyful with no holding back. They're clear and vibrant. They leap out of the image and assault the senses and there's only one other vintage lens I can think of, the Helios 40, that makes stronger colours than this one. This lens has inherently strong contrast and makes strong and punchy images, although if there's a light source in the frame, contrast will drop quickly and reflection artefacts from internal elements appear, but that's easily cured by using a lens hood. Strong contrast helps to create strong colours and it's the same for black and white images too. They're bold, strong and defined with a great tonal range. Most vintage wide aperture lenses will show some vignetting or darkening in the corners when shot wide open and this one is no exception. Just as with other vintage 1.4s though, it clears up significantly by f4 and it's gone by f8. Background blur from this lens is absolutely lovely. It's some of the nicest, most well controlled I've seen. Up close it's super smooth and soft as we might expect but the real test comes when subject to camera and camera to background distances change. Under these conditions harshness will often emerge but here again the Minolta distinguishes itself because while there are points where blur becomes unsettled it never becomes so unsettled that it becomes unpleasant and harshness as such doesn't really arise. 
blur always seems to remain acceptably smooth and never reaches a point where it might detract from a shot. This lens has been a big surprise, a 60-year-old design that can hold its own among much more modern glass. In good condition, they sell for around 80 to 100 pounds, which, for a lens of this quality, just has to be a bargain. Our next lens is from the mid to late 70s, the Nikon Nikkor 50mm f1.4 AI, and it too has outstanding build quality. As we might expect from Nikon, it's made entirely of metal with no plastic components and the general feeling of quality is very high. The click stop aperture ring rotates cleanly and aperture values run from f1.4 to f16. Minimum focus distance is 45 centimeters and the focus throw is just over 180 degrees. The focus ring turns smoothly and freely, but it's not quite as silky smooth as it should be on this one. Strictly speaking, it needs relubrication, but it's perfectly usable for now. Just like the Minolta, even wide open, this lens is more than acceptably sharp. In fact, they seem about as sharp as each other, and you can shoot this little Nikon wide open all day long without it lacking in sharpness. It renders even fine detail very clearly and, although it's slightly softer in the corners, it is only slightly softer and it's unlikely to detract from the image. Stopping down sharpens the image considerably and by f8 it gives clear, clean and crisp images that will match most other lenses for sharpness and will exceed a great many. Stopping down will also reduce the vignetting effect that all fast vintage lenses exhibit. I think wide open vignetting is a little worse on this lens than it is on the Minolta, but in any case, it's entirely gone by f8. This lens has good contrast and it makes strong and punchy images in both colour and black and white. Whites are bright and blacks are deep and there's a good range of tones between the two. Having said that though, contrast seems slightly less strong than in the Minolta. Colour representation is different too because while the Minolta boosts colours to high saturation, the Nikon seems to rein them in a bit. They're definitely that bit more restrained, that bit more delicate, and where the Minolta makes a splash, the Nikon is rather more subtle. It isn't just intensity of colour that marks the difference either, there's also a difference in the tone of colours. AI lenses seem to give rather cool tones, emphasising the blue-green end of the spectrum, giving a very recognisable and distinctive colour signature. And while it's a different approach to that of the Minolta, it nevertheless makes some striking, beautiful and distinctive images. Being an f1.4 lens, the Nikon generates plenty of background blur, and shooting close to the subject, it's soft, smooth and creamy. Unlike the Minolta though, as camera, subject and background distances change, it doesn't always stay that way. For the most part, it's smooth and very pleasing, giving a lovely soft feel to a shot, but there are points where it really does become quite nervous and rather harsh and jittery, and on those occasions, I think it does detract from the shot. Nikon lenses tend to be a little more expensive than some other makes, and good copies of this one go for around 100 to 140 pounds. There's no doubt it can make some striking and beautiful images, but other lenses can do that too. Few are as nicely made as this one though, and if you're looking for quality of manufacturing and you like its colour palette, this could well be the lens for you. Our final lens for today is the Canon FD 50mm f1.4. Unlike the Nikon and Minolta, this lens does use some plastic in its construction, although critical parts like the barrel and focusing helix are metal.
Apertures run from f1.4 to f22, and there's a half click stop between each aperture value. Minimum focus distance is 45 centimeters. The focus ring is silky smooth, and the focus throw is just over 180 degrees. For a 1.4 lens, wide open, this lens is really sharp and it's noticeably sharper than both the Minolta and the Nikon, neither of which I'd call soft. In fact, wide open, it's the sharpest vintage 1.4 I've used, and that by some margin. It's really quite incredibly sharp, and each element in the plane of focus is resolved crisply and cleanly. Stopping down to f4, banishes any remnants of softness, producing a bitingly sharp image, easily equaling what the stop-down Nikon and Minolta can do, and perhaps even exceeding them. It does show some fairly heavy vignetting fully open, about the same as the other two, so it's best not to shoot against light backgrounds at f1.4 if you don't like the vignetting effect. Colours from this lens are spectacular, an exuberant, joyous riot. It's a different look to the Minolta though, because while the Canon's colours are certainly high in saturation, they also have a delicacy. They're bold and prominent, but not overpowering, a very distinctive look. Background blur from this lens is very nice indeed, some of the nicest I've seen from any vintage lens. Up close it's smooth and soft of course, but it remains smooth and soft as camera, subject and background distances change. Although a hint of nervousness can creep in from time to time, it never grows to the point where it feels unpleasant, and it never detracts from the image. Canon FD lenses tend to be cheaper than lenses from other major manufacturers, and that's the case with this one. Good copies can be had from around 50 to 80 pounds or thereabouts, and considering what this lens can do at that price, it's an absolute steal. So, there we are. Three fantastic f1.4 vintage lenses all of which will make some outstanding images with a unique and distinctive look and feel, and all of which will give more blur than you ever decently need. Buy one, try one. I don't think you'll regret it. So, that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to support it and help it to grow and develop, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, many thanks for watching and I will see you next time for some more xenography.